Mr. Palmer, you told police that you saw a suspicious looking man outside of the apartment building when you left that evening. Is he here in court? The man in the red tie. I ask that the record reflect that the witness identified the defendant. No further questions. Mr. Caruso? In Reading Jail by Reading Town, there is a pit of shame. And in it lies a wretched man, eaten by teeth of flame. In a burning winding sheet he lies, and his grave has got no name. And there, till Christ call forth the dead, in silence let him lie. No need to waste the foolish tear or heave the windy sigh. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Do you recognize that, Mr. Palmer? No, I don't. <laughs> it's called The Ballad of Reading Jail by Oscar Wilde. It was the subject of a lecture you said you attended the night of your wife's murder. You see, they changed the program that night. And the professor who was supposed to lecture on Lord Byron took ill. There was a last minute substitution. But you couldn't know that, could you, Mr. Palmer, because you weren't there? Of course I was. I, I just forgot about the poem. Where's this going, Your Honor? I'll be there shortly. Proceed. Mr. Palmer, when is the first time you met the defendant, Mr. Ramirez? The first time I saw him was outside my building. Are you sure? Are you sure you didn't first see him in a place called Dooley's Bar? Are you sure you didn't get him drunk and convince him to rob your apartment, which you told him would be empty? Why would I rob my own apartment? Your wife had a bad habit of buying expensive jewelry, which you needed to support your bad habit, cocaine. Mr. Palmer is not on trial here, Your Honor. Your Honor. My client is on trial for his life. And I must request a full exploration of the facts so that I may demonstrate his innocence. Overruled. Isn't it true, Mr. Palmer, that you set your door alarm so that when Mr. Ramirez came into the apartment, he would be caught there, along with the body of your murdered wife, which you had left in the bathroom? Your Honor. Your wife was in the bathroom, applying, I think they call them acrylic nails. But when the police found her body, three of those nails were not attached to her fingers. Well, the police had their killer, so they didn't bother to look. But I did. And I found them on the bathroom floor. Defense Exhibit G. And do you know what I think, Mr. Palmer? I think you came up behind her. And when you were strangling the last bit of breath from her body, she reached back and scratched at her attacker broke off those three acrylic nails. Do you always wear Turnbull and Asser? Excuse me? Your shirt. Sometimes. Will you show the court your neck? Show the court, Mr. Palmer. The other side, please. But all men kill the thing they love. By all, let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. And now, Mr. Palmer, will you not finally tell us the truth? Move for a dismissal. The people concur. Case dismissed. Take the witness into custody. All rise. Congratulations. Did you know Ramirez was innocent when you took the case? From the moment I laid eyes on him. You can read mine, too, Anthony. Do you want me to read yours? So what's next? Well, oh, Milano, Firenze, Napoli, tutte le belle cose d'Italia, Michelangelo. Will you excuse me? I see a friend. Dee! So nice to see you. Anthony. I think I caught you at the wrong time. No, no, no. It's never the wrong time for you. How are you, my dear? 
David needs your help. Are you free for dinner? Yes. Let's go. Why didn't David tell me he was facing bankruptcy? He didn't want to admit he had made bad investments. Yeah, he knew I'd jump right down his throat. What about his work? The last I heard, David was in Paris photographing Dior's collection for Vogue. That was five years ago, Anthony. David hasn't worked since. I'm afraid his style is thought of as passé. Elegance and beauty are now passé. Requiescat in pacem. I will never accept it. You sound like David. But he's had an idea that could turn things around for him. So he sent you to get me so I can help him pull off this brainstorm, whatever it is. He wants to reunite the models he made famous in the 70s and 80s. Abby, Jane, Shelley, and Nina for one fabulous session. He's not talking about photography, Anthony. He's talking about art, contemporary art. Warhol's Maryland times five. He's including me, too. What do you think? I think David has lost his mind. Let me iterate the obvious. David's ex-models are also David's ex-wives. I'm the fellow who negotiated all four divorces. And if memory serves, Jane, Shelley, Nina, and Abby are not exactly fond of Mr. David Morrison at this point in history. But they like you, Anthony. You were as kind to them as you've been to me. They'll do it for you. I admire you, Dee. I really do. There's no other woman in the world who would want her husband reunited with his ex-wives no matter how important, whatever the reason. I love David. I believe in his love for me, his talent, and this project. Well, David is an artist. The Modern Art Museum is funding this, Anthony. Eventually, these photographs will become part of a major exhibit. What model wouldn't want to be a part of this project? Are you and David still in Denver? Yes, we are. Well, I have an old friend there who has an office. Maybe I can make arrangements to use it. <laughs> Thank you. OK, listen, you carry the salad. We are about to experience linguine alla caruso. Avanti, cara. Hello, Anthony. How nice to hear from you. Yeah, I suppose I could come. You want me to fly out Wednesday, October 3rd? Anthony, why do you want to see me? Ah, oh, your Mr. Powell is some dynamo, running his company and his <laughs> banks and making all the plans for your wedding. And now I hear he's thinking of politics. How do you keep up with him? Spencer thrives on activity. That's why he's so successful. Oh. Miss Marlowe, it's a Mr. Caruso. Oh. Anthony. <laughs> How delightful. How are you? You want me to go where? Oh, sure. Sure, I'll come. Anthony, can you loan me some money, please? Come on, this is taking forever. Uh, just a sec, babe. We're going for perfect. Perfect? I am perfect. This won't be my 14th elegance. Oh, cover. you're great. You're great, babe. Uh, could, could you take just one step closer? Excuse me. What is this? I'm sorry, Nina. It's from America. It better be Hillary, or at least Bill. It's Mr. Anthony Caruso. Anthony, how are you? Morning, Della. Morning, Ken. You never told me you had 20 admirers. 
Oh, they're all from Anthony Caruso. The Anthony Caruso? Mm-hmm. Oh, wonderful man. What's he doing sending you flowers? Well, he's going to be using the office while Perry's in Washington. Oh, I can't wait to meet him. What's he like? <laughs> like that. Stella, you are lovelier every time I see you. Anthony Caruso, you'll <laughs> never change, no. thank God. <laughs> good to see you. It's good to see you. This has got to be Ken Molansky. Perry's told me a lot about you. It's a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure's mine. You've tried some very impressive cases, sir. Well, thank you. You call me Anthony, all right? Listen, when the ladies get here, and this is quite a group, which is in them right here. Okay. <laughs> Whoever would have thought we'd all be meeting like this? What is this, anyway? The David Morrison Ex-Wives Club? Maybe this is Anthony's idea of a joke. Ah. Is that the designer grunge look, Shelley, or did you find that outfit in a dumpster? I hear you're marrying an old, fat man with money. What else can she do? Her exercise video bombed. Darling, I've heard Elegance fired you. Hardly. I made them fire the director. Hey, did they have videos back in your day? What's so funny, Abby? Us. All of us. Bitching away at one another. Meow. The last time I saw you, you went for my throat. You mean when I caught you in bed with David? Well, you couldn't hold on to him. Neither could you. Can't fight. <laughs> Excuse me, ladies. Mr. Caruso is waiting for you. Okay, you've all come a long way, and I want to get right to the point. I want to explain what David has in mind. Before you do, Anthony, I want you to know that I'm here because you're a dear friend, not because I have any interest in what David wants. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you for that, all of you. But I also think you're going to like David's idea. I doubt it. So what does he want? David wants all of you to join him at a photographic retrospective funded by and exhibited at the American Museum of Modern Art. Well, if David wants me to do this, it's going to cost him. I mean, Anthony, even you have to admit, David treated us like something he'd scrape off his shoe. As you may have guessed, David is broke. And no one knows better than I how difficult a man he is. He's been my friend and client for 20 years. I don't want any part of this. I'm going to ask you to consider something, all right? Think back when David was the number one guy in the fashion industry. He took each one of you from obscurity and made you famous. So the money, the success, the glamour, the fame is all due to David. David's a louse. Far be it from me to talk you out of your feelings, but on the other hand, who but David could offer you the opportunity to be in the American Museum of Modern Art? Immortal. <laughs> Anthony, you fox. You're saying David is going to immortalize us. All right. I'm going to take a chance here. I'm going to go out on a limb. If you won't do it for David, Will you do it for me? Remember, we're all experts on David's marriages. It's a club you can't quit. I just want to get this over with.
I'm really very grateful to all of you for doing this. And so is David. It means a lot to him. Oh, don't thank us. Thank Anthony Caruso. Ah, uh, David seems to be running a little late. Which is the be quick? That's what you look like. Luscious assortment of extraordinarily beautiful ladies. Hello, darling. Hello, Shelley. You're still angry with me. And all of you as beautiful as ever. Or will be again when I get through with you. Would you kindly take these beautiful ladies to the dressing room? Okay? And I will be with you. I'm just going to prepare the shoot. I love you. Where have you been? I asked you to get David back here look, on time. Look, I did my best, all right? I'm sorry. David does what he wants. Listen, part of your job is to keep David on schedule. I don't hear David complaining. Like to follow me? Keep an eye on her, darling. Beautiful, my God, my Gorgeous. I love it. Perfect. I love it. I love it. Just like, just like that. Peace out to you. Okay? Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, my God, the memories this brings back. Will you stop doing that, please? Beautiful. I love it. Here, there we go. Now you move a little bit more to the left over there. Married to all of you. Will you please stop doing that? You're supposed to shoot pictures of me working. Not getting in my way, all right? I'm sorry, Mr. Morrison. Did you say you study photography? Yes. And pay attention. Will you tell those idiots across the hall to turn down the music? Now, please. I'm sorry, girls. Here we go. Oh, forget it. My hip's killing me. I'm hungry. Is anybody else hungry? David, we need a break. And uh, I need a break. OK. Take a break for now. Come back at 9 o'clock. And no desserts. Hey. Yes, my sweetheart. How are we doing? We're doing very well. Why did you join them? I'm feeling awkward around them. But don't feel awkward around them. Just think of them as relatives. Okay? I got work to do, sweetheart. Make them feel at home, please. Puzzled look. You're having an affair with Margot. I am not. The innocent voice. Margot made it obvious. Well, then she's lying. He's lying. Where is she now? I threw her out. Come, ladies. Unless you want to watch a replay of your own divorce. Wait a minute. We haven't finished working yet. Tomorrow, darling. Have a nice night, you two. We told you. Good night, sweetheart. What the hell did she say or do to her? I'll tell you what she did. She was coming out of the dark room, buttoning up her blouse. Well, for your information, she wasn't in the dark room with me, all right? I think what happened is she's tried to get even with me. Because I got angry with her before. She deliberately did this to upset you. Am I supposed to believe this? Sweetheart, I never touched her. I never would. I love you. Don't you know that? I thought so. It's confused Abby and D, Shelley. what happened between them and me has nothing to do with us. Nothing. But I should have known they would poison the air. I 
tell you what I'm going to do. I'll scrap this entire project because I'll not have this ruin our marriage. Do you mean that? Of course I mean that. Don't you know how much I adore you? How much I absolutely love you? Come here. David. Yes, my darling. I won't let you call off this project. It's important to me, too. My darling, it's not important to me if it comes between you and me. It won't. It won't. Are you sure? Positive. You're so adorable. You're very tired, though. I want you to go home and rest. I have some things to do in the dark room still, and I'll be right home. Okay? I love you. I love you more. Excuse me. I'm Lieutenant Brock. May I ask who you are? Dee Morrison. David Morrison's wife? Yes. Well, Mrs. Morrison, I'm afraid I have some very bad news for you, ma'am. David. Yes, ma'am. Your husband was killed earlier this evening. Oh, my God. What? What happened? He was stabbed to death, ma'am. I know the name, I know the name. Are you holding Dee Morrison? And charging her with murder. I have an eyewitness. No, check that. I have several eyewitnesses who say she and Mr. Morrison had a real free-for-all. I got another eyewitness who saw her leaving the studio at 10 p.m., not at 9. And my men found her blood-stained dress in the trunk of her car along with the murder weapon. Is she a client of yours? She is now. I didn't kill David. I believe you, Dee. Did you argue with David in front of witnesses? Yes. And what a thrill it was for those four, believe me. Probably went somewhere to drink champagne out of each other's shoes. But before I came home, David and I made up. I swear. What is it that you argued with him about? 
David's new assistant, Margo. The little tramp pretended David was having an affair with her. Was he? No. He said Margo was a liar, and I believe him. He said he loved me. He did love me, Anthony. With all his heart. Okay, Mr. Morrison, time to go. Promise me you won't worry. Promise me. I'm sure the judge is going to set a reasonable bail. Right. Lieutenant, you take good care of her, huh? It's just a little something. I wanted to thank you both. You're welcome. Thanks for the tickets. They're supposed to be on the 50-yard line. I hope they are. <laughs> so, um, it seems that David's ex-wives are becoming friends. Now that David isn't here to fight over. Either one of them or David's assistant, Margot, must have killed David. Let's think about what happened. The ex-wives were there. When Dee confronted Margot, Margot got upset and ran out. Then the ex-wives saw Dee argue with David. Any one of them could have set her up. We know something about the ex-wives, but so far, Margot's a mystery. Why wasn't she at the funeral? And was there anything really going on between Margot and David? Interesting questions. Dee, will you tell Della everything you can think of about the ex-wives? With pleasure. And Ken. I know. Find Margot. You're ahead of me. I don't know about that. Wait a second. Can I just forget this whole thing, please? Look, I'm a lawyer. My name is Ken Molansky. I'm investigating the murder of David Morrison. Oh, what does that have to do with me? Are you Margot Rentel? That dumb blonde's my sister. I'm Deborah. Uh, oh! Ow! What's the for? Look what you did to my car. Four separate limousines. And champagne. Yeah. And buy out the restaurant. Huh? And a gift. Yeah, but it's not like him to be late. Working all the time to save Dee, no doubt. That dip? You know, the way she killed David was really lame. You know, <laughs> when I caught David cheating, I was going to send him a bottle of poison champagne. 
But I didn't know anything about poison. <laughs> Waiter, what kind of poison goes well with champagne? <laughs> now, when I caught David, I was going to shoot him. But then I figured, hey, I'm too young and beautiful to spend my life in jail. I thought that I would kill him. And then I would say, I thought he was a burglar. But he left me before I could do it. I thought simple death was way too good for David. I wanted to gaslight him into suicide. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> My dear ladies. Oh, there you are. I hate to interrupt your homicidal fantasies, which I have enjoyed to the utmost, but lunch oh. is served. Oh, great. Ah. Oh. We have a veal piccata, which is, as you know, sauteed in lemon and butter. Bravo. <laughs> Ciccata. And then we have a specialty of mine, broccoli di rapi alla caruso, which is sautéed in olive oil and garlic, once again with the same garnish. I hope you enjoy it very much. Mm, bravo, bravo. Thank you. Uh, why don't you open your presents? Okay. I must tell you that Dee did not kill David, but it's possible that one of you did. This is a subpoena. And what does this mean, Anthony? It means you can't leave town until after the hearing. I love you all. Bon appétit. Au revoir. What? So I, um, I started seeing country in some clubs in uh, Wyoming near Casper. That's my hometown. Folks, they've got sort of a Dolly Parton sound. Yeah. Now I'm just saving up for a body to match. <laughs> oh, good luck. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Here, this is for the headlight. This is the least I can do. Now, what about Margo? She's a bimbo. I drive all the way from Casper. As soon as I get here, she's she's walking out the door. She says she's got a job in another town. Did she say where? All she told me was I shouldn't make any long distance phone calls. Do you know if she took a plane, train, or a bus? <laughs> Look, for all I know, she hiked her skirt and she hit. When will she be back? You just you just don't get it, do you, Melansky? Okay, look, ever since I stole Margo's boyfriend, she doesn't exactly tell me anything. I'm stuffed. <clears throat> no, it's been a trip. See ya. Can I get a check, please? Hey, wait a second. There you go. Where are you? Outside Margot's apartment. She was a blonde, right, Della? Yes, slim, about 115 pounds, dark eyes. Well, I don't think she's a blonde anymore. What do you mean? Well, I met with a young woman who claims to be Margot's sister. She says Margot left town. But get this, she matches the description you gave me, except she has brown hair, and I just found a blonde wig inside Margot's apartment. I'll be in touch.
Jane. Anthony, what are you doing here? Well, I'm going through David's papers to help prepare for Dee's defense. What are you doing here? Oh, I left my watch for Cartier, an engagement present from my fiance. Hmm. That's the kind of present I like the best. Sentimental <laughs> and expensive. Why'd you take it off? It was snagging my stockings, huh? the diamonds. If I lost it, Spencer would be very upset. He's got political aspirations, doesn't he? He plans to run for the Senate. And like Caesar's wife, Spencer Powell's wife must be above reproach. That's why I can understand why you so desperately want those photos back. What are you talking about, Anthony? When you first met David, he convinced you to pose nude. Didn't you tell him that returning the photos was your price for doing the session with the other wives? That's absurd. No, it's not absurd. It's the truth. You know that. And I know that. How do you know this? I found them. I also found the notes on your conversations with David. David kept a file on me. On almost everyone, not you alone. He was documenting every moment of his life. I think he was going to write his memoirs. <sighs> that rat. I want the pictures and the notes. I'd like to accommodate you, but I'm afraid I can't. Why, I thought you liked me. No, no, I adore you. You know, back when you were handling the divorce, I even thought that someday, maybe, you and I could... Oh, uh, be still my heart. The fact that that thought even crossed your mind is a memory I'll treasure forever. The photos must remain with the estate, as must the notes on the conversations, but I will do everything in my power to see that no one ever sees them. This is a nightmare. I know. As soon as this is over, I'm going home to get married. And you must invite me to the wedding, because there's nothing I like better than dancing at someone else's wedding. Betsy, I'm Ken Moffat. You've heard of me. You're absolutely right. I'm that rambling guy from radio station KCDM, and I am here to tell you that if the numbers on your driver's license add up to an even number, you win $25. You are the rambling guy? Uh, my purse is in the back. Don't go away. Okay, consolation prize is $20. Oh, my God. This is great. This is great. <laughs> Do you want to go out? Sorry, can't. Got to ramble. Um, well, I'm here every day, 9 to 5. <laughs> That's great. David told me I could have these photographs. Did he mention it to you? Oh, no, but, Ina, your word is good enough for me. Oh, hey, look at this. David took this of me in Hong Kong for Versace. <laughs> very pretty, very colorful. What does it feel like to be that perfect? <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Before you came here, when was the last time you saw David? Divorce court. Has anybody ever told you that when you lie, your eyes widen? Why, did David tell you I called him? In a manner of speaking. He kept a journal, and in the journal it tells how many times you called begging him to take you back. You know, of all the ex-wives, you're the one who really loved David, truly loved him, and never got over him. No, oh, no, you're wrong there, because I've never met a man I didn't get over. Except David. What if when you came here and you saw David with Dee, you realized it was hopeless? How angry would that make you feel? You don't know how I feel. Oh, but I can guess. I think it would have made you more than angry. I think it would have made you enraged that for all your wealth and beauty and all your love for David, that you were a woman scorned. And your great love for David would have turned into a hatred so deep that you'd rather see him dead 
than happy with another woman. Just tell me I'm wrong. I don't want any. I'm not selling anything. Name's Melansky. I'm a lawyer. I'm looking for Deborah. Yeah? So am I. She took off with my car. Nice. When she brings it back, if she brings it back, I'm gonna give that little girl as much grief as she's given me. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, look, can I use your phone? I'll pay for the call. Okay. Thanks. There's the phone. Hello, Perry Mason's office. No, oh, it's Ken. Now, where are you? Really, who'd have thought? <laughs> Who would have thought what? Of all the courtrooms in all the world, she had to walk into mine. Ken, you're up to something. Always. Do I have any messages? No. No kidding. When'd she call? Ken, are you all right? Yeah, no problem. I'll send her roses, Della. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Just ought to handle it. Hope you get your car back. Me too. You don't look happy to see me. Why don't you stay right there? Uh-uh. I'll shoot. I don't think so. Maybe she will and maybe she won't. But I'm sure she does that. Hey, can't we talk about this? Yes. Give me a second, will you? Put your hands up, feller, and turn around. Don't know what you told those tow truck guys, but you don't live here. Uh, now, wait a minute. My name's Ken Molansky. You're breaking and entering. I'm calling the cops. I'm a lawyer. I'm looking for Cutter. I didn't break anything. The door was wide open. It sounds like Cutter. Man goes off and parties with his deadbeat friends all night and then leaves the door wide open. I guess he's not a good neighbor, huh? Well, his property's a mess. His parties are too loud. He's a terrible neighbor. You know where I can find him? He in trouble? I'd say so. Good. He works at Red's boarding stable over in Golden. 
Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony, what a surprise. Come in. I'll put those over here, please. Yes, ma'am. We got two suits, dress, and this hot little number. That's it. Thank you. What are you waiting for? I told the boutique to charge this stuff to my room. Thank you, sir. Don't you love hotels, Anthony? I mean, you can get anything you want. You can get clothes. You can get perfume and real jewelry. Most people would be satisfied with magazines and toothpaste. Yeah, well, when David was alive, all I got was grief. And now that he's dead, he treats me so much better. Shelley, David promised to pay the expenses of his models while you were all here for the shoot. And the estate will continue to pay until after the hearing, but only for legitimate expenses. And what do you consider illegitimate expenses? This, the bracelet, that case of scotch over there. Well, I had to order booze. I mean, I drank the whole minibar, and David left orders. They shouldn't restock it. Yeah, he did you a favor. Or do you want a drink? I don't want a drink. What has happened to you? What have you done to yourself? The police have picked you up for D and D, petty theft, <laughs> possession. My God, even prostitution to help pay for your habit. What has happened to you? Yeah, well, it was all David's fault, you know. He was my pusher. He turned me on. He gave me everything that I wanted. And then he dropped me for Nina. Don't con me. This isn't about David. It's about you. You hated David. Yeah, well, he could have helped me when I was in trouble. He could have hired a lawyer. And he hung me out to dry instead. He didn't even return my phone calls. You're lying, Shelley. What are you talking about? In the past two years alone, you called David at least a half a dozen times, demanding money That's and threatening lie. his life. Did David say that? You know, he was a sick, sick man. He kept notes on the conversations. I saw them with my own eyes. You said you would dance on his grave. I didn't mean that. I was just talking No, about... you were just out of control. You were drunk, capable of maybe even murder. Do you have friends, Shelley? No. You don't have friends. You have pips, and you have pushers, and guys you take home at night without even asking their names. But they use I you, and you use them. I this conversation. I want you to leave. I leave. But first, you're gonna meet somebody I want you to meet. Right on time. Hello, Anthony. Dr. Cooper, this is Shelley Morrison. It's Anthony, nice to meet you, Ms. Morrison. What is this all about? Dr. Cooper runs the drug and alcohol rehab facility here in Denver. After the hearing, if you're not arrested for David's murder, you're going to spend 30 I days in the facility. will not! Then I'm going to call your probation officer and tell him you haven't been clean and sober. So it's either rehab or it's prison. This is not fair. It is. Be good to yourself. And I'll see you in court. barn you got here. Hell, want to buy it? <laughs> Not today. I'm looking for a guy named Dan Cutter. I hear he hangs around up here. Hell, I 86 that Yahoo two weeks ago. Can't have a conversation that doesn't end in a fight. Know where I can find him? Don't know and don't care. You a cop? Lawyer. No kidding. Listen, uh, this stable would make a good investment. Wouldn't sell it, but uh, I've got to retire. Got a bad ticker. <laughs> well, I'll think about it. Thanks a lot. Hey, lawyer. Guy in the back named J.D. Big fellow, red shirt and mustache. Maybe he can help you. Thanks a lot. 
50. Fifty and I'll see you. Oh, damn! <laughs> Your name J.D.? Yeah. My name's Molanski. I'm looking for Dan Cutter. You a cop? No, I'm a lawyer. Just want to ask him a few questions. You know where I can find him? For two hundred dollars, I might. You go to the Wild Horse Roadhouse off of I-91. Tell the guy behind the bar that J.D. sent you. Is he gonna be there? Should be. Anthony, Della told me I'd find you here. Oh, are you, Abby? Won't you have a seat? Thank you. Well, is there something I can do for you? Yes. Loan me a copy of the museum's mailing list. I want to send out brochures of my work. That's a terrific idea. Thank you. So your career is going well? Very well. My paintings are selling great. I was Southwestern Artist of the Year last year. Then why did I get the idea that you were still angry at David for breaking his promise to buy you an art gallery? Anthony. David broke promise to all his wives. Why should I be different? But you were different. You accepted a reduced divorce settlement in return for David's verbal promise to set you up in business. And then when he reneged on that later, you felt swindled. How would you feel? I don't know. I only know that if I were your lawyer, I would have advised you to get that promise in writing. The lawyer I hired told me I didn't have a case. And that made you even more angry. So angry that you wrote him this letter threatening to kill him for what he had done to you. Anthony. That was a long time ago. I've moved on since then. I have a life now as an artist. I wish that were so. But despite the very good front you put up, your career has never materialized. How can you say that? I'm not trying to be cruel, Abby. I'm really not. But your paintings have never sold. You've never won any awards. In fact, for the past several years, you've been supporting yourself by painting murals on people's living room walls. Who told you that? That doesn't matter. Well, so what? A lot of artists wait for years for their work to be recognized. My success is a matter of time. I hope so. But wouldn't your life be easier now if David had kept his promise? If I was going to kill David, I would have done it when he divorced me. Oh, no, not necessarily. Your rage against David didn't start until after he broke his promise. Can I have that list, please? Absolutely. Good luck. Thank you, Anthony. Nice day, huh? Where'll it be? JD sent me. That so? What's on your mind? Does anyone know where I can find Dan Cutter? You a friend of Dan's? You might say that. Any friend of Dan's must be as crooked as he is. When you see that lousy SOB, you tell him we want our money. Hey, wait. No, you wait, buddy. You brought a message from JD? We got a message for Dan! <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Friend of Dan's can handle that bull. I want to buy you a beer, partner. And I want to drink it. Where'd you learn to ride bull like that? Law school. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you deal him out? You know something? I like your friends a hell of a lot better than I like you, JD. Now, where's Cutter? Hey! Let go of me. You're going to tell me. I ain't going to tell you nothing for nothing. How much? $500. What? And for another $500, i will take you to him. 
First you lied to me, now I'm supposed to hand you over a thousand bucks? If you want to find Cutter. He's mean, Milansky. He's back up in them hills. Now you go after him alone, you're gonna get yourself lost. You're gonna get snake bit, then Cutter's gonna find you and he's gonna kill you. And you're gonna keep all that from happening? Yep. Think it over. 200 now, 800 when I have Cutter. Six now, four later. Five now, five later. After the next hand. Game's over, cowboy. Come on. Let's go. Lieutenant Brock, mm -hmm. you conducted the investigation into the death of David Morrison? Yes, I did, sir. I show you this antique dagger, People's Exhibit Number 3, and ask if you recognize it. <laughs> yes, it has my mark on it. We've already heard testimony that this dagger was used to kill David Morrison. Huh? When did you first see this weapon? We found it in the trunk of D. Morrison's car. And whose blood was on that dress? Well, it was blood type O, the same as the victim's. Thank you, Lieutenant. You're quite welcome, sir. Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. You may step down, Lieutenant. That's his car. Yep. Joe, this is Ken. Ken, this is Joe. Joe. Sorry, we can't help you. We're booked all the way through November. Well, I'm not on vacation. I'm looking for Dan Cutter. You missed him. Where'd he go? Up into the Medicine Bow Mountains. He and that girlfriend, Deborah, hunting elk. You know it's black powder season. I met Deborah. When will they be back? I don't know. Depends when they kill their elk. Could be a couple weeks. I can't wait a couple of weeks. Well, I know the medicine bow and I can track. I'll take you to him. How much? 1500 plus expenses. Forget it. Fine. I got a poker game. You know anyone that can track me to Dan Cutter? Nope. One thousand, no expenses. You ever been on a horse? Yeah. But you've never been in the medicine bow. So what? One thousand, no expenses. Man can't live without food. Two hundred for expenses, and that's it. Done. Got yourself a deal. Why don't you run over there and say hello to your transportation? <laughs> Mr. Jones, am I correct in saying that you are a member of the rock music band called uh, Motivation? Yeah, I lead guitarist. I write songs, too. And how long has your band been playing together? Uh, two, three years. We uh, play gigs around town, nothing big yet, but, you know, it'll happen. I'm sure it will. How long has your band been rehearsing in the studio across from the studio of the late David Morrison? Same time, two, three years. Mm -hmm. And were you rehearsing the night that David Morrison was killed? Yeah, two new songs I wrote. Do you happen to remember what time you finished rehearsal? Yeah, 10 o'clock exactly. Why exactly? Because according to our rental agreement, we had to stop playing at 10. Was this always the case? No, we used to uh, jam half the night, but Somebody complained. When you say somebody, you mean David Morrison? Well, yeah, yeah. All right. Mr. Jones, can you tell us what you saw the night that David Morrison was killed? At 10 o'clock, I came out of the studio. I lit a cigarette, and I looked up, and I saw Dee Morrison heading for the elevator. What angle did you see her at? Was it the front, side, the back? The back. Then how did you know it was she? Easy. For, you know, two, three years, I've been seeing her go in and out of her husband's studio. And on that particular night, how was the lighting in the hallway? Same as always. I could see all right. And the woman you identify as Dee Morrison, how was she dressed? <laughs> to kill. 
Oh, I mean, sorry, I mean, um, she had the red dress, the uh, red hat, the red shoes with the heels. It was dynamite. The dress she was wearing, could you describe that for us? I don't know, um, silk, neck up to here, uh, long sleeves, short skirt. All right, I want to see if I've got this straight. She was wearing a long sleeve dress with a high neck, and a hat. Was it a big hat? Mm -hmm. And a big hat. And she was walking away from you. Please forgive me, Mr. Jones. But how could you possibly know it was Dee Morrison? I could tell by her legs. By her legs? Dee Morrison has great legs, man. I mean, I know legs. I, uh, I study legs. I love legs. And uh, Dee Morrison's are the best. I told that to her husband once, he agreed. I'd know Dee Morrison's legs anywhere. That's interesting. Dee Morrison told me exactly the same thing. Mr. Jones, a connoisseur of legs like yourself should have the chance to prove it, don't you think so? Yeah, sure. Your Honor, since the eyewitness testimony that this witness has given could put my client in jail for the rest of her life, it is imperative that there be no mistake. To guarantee that, I have prepared a small demonstration. With your permission? Your Honor, I object. Mr. Caruso is well known for his use of courtroom theatrics. Oh, Your Honor. Proceed, Mr. Caruso. Thank you. Lift that curtain about one third. And stop. Oh, what is this, a peep show? I object, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Markham has already agreed to a lineup. The form should not be an issue, it seems to me. The court has already given its permission for this demonstration, Mr. Markham. Mr. Caruso, continue. Thank you. All right. Mr. Jones, since you have based your identification of Dee Morrison on her legs, it seems to me that you should be able to tell the court which pair of legs belong to Dee Morrison, should you not? There are a lot of legs, man. Come, 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 Mr. Jones. You have said that you could identify those legs anywhere. So which pair of legs belongs to Dee Morrison? Second pair from the left. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Do you want to take some more time? Would you like to step down and get closer? No, man. I've admired those legs every day for the past two years. Second pair from the left right there. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Raise the curtain all the way. Ladies, will you please turn around? As you can see, Dee Morrison was not behind that curtain. She went out that door and then came back in through that door while you were studying our volunteers' legs. Thank you, ladies, very much. Your Honor, I have no more questions for this witness. <laughs> I have no questions. You still with me, Melansky? Much farther. I don't know. Here looks like good place as any. Why don't we just make camp? Great. You okay? Oh, Greg. I thought you might be a little sore or something, but uh, I guess not, huh? Never felt better. You know Cutter very well? Yeah, he's a good buddy of mine. Feel the same way about you? Yep. If you're such good friends, why are you leading me to him? Well, you're paying me. Yeah, if Cutter paid you more money, you'd probably shoot me and leave me up here. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have to shoot you. I'd just ride off and leave you. You don't know where you are, where you've been, or where you're going. You'd just starve to death. Are you threatening to leave me up here? Right now, I'm fixing to get some sleep. I asked you a question. Answer me. 
I'm fixing to get some sleep. You ought to do the same thing. I'm not tired. I paid you a thousand bucks, and you were supposed to take me to Cutter. You saying I broke my word? <laughs> well, you weren't there when I got up this morning. You questioning my honor? Oh, knock it off, J.D. You wouldn't know honor if it asked you to dance. Now, where the hell were you? Round us up some breakfast. <laughs> Where'd you think you was going, riding off trail the wrong way like that? I didn't know there was a trail. You wouldn't know it if you seen it. That's why I hired you. And to find Dan Cutter. And while you've been busy trying to hang on to that horse, I've been tracking Cutter. Is it gonna cost me another thousand before I find him? You a cynical man, Molansky. Now, Cutter and his girlfriend, Deborah, he's camped about three miles up the canyon on Gold Creek. So why don't you just get your horse and follow me? Hold on a second, J.D. Oh, 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 oh. It's okay. It's okay. Good boy. All right. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> What was your relationship with David Morrison? I was the first of his many wives. And you were divorced from David Morrison? David divorced me. Yet you agreed to participate in his latest photographic project. Yes, you telephoned me and I came to Denver. So I did, and so you did. Did you agree because you were still in love with David Morrison? <laughs> Hardly. I participated because this project was to be exhibited in the American Museum of Modern Art. And as an artist, frankly, it was a connection that could be very useful to me. I see. Now, you mentioned the telephone call that I made to you when you were in Santa Fe. Do you happen to remember the date of that call? Yes, it was September 12th. I remember because I completed a very important painting that day. September 12th uh, was approximately three weeks before David's project was scheduled to begin. Yes. Now, what did you do in those three weeks uh, between the time I called you in Santa Fe and you and the other ex-wives met with me in my office? What did I do? Hmm. I was painting in Santa Fe. I see. Before this trip, when was the last time you were in Denver? I haven't been to Denver since my divorce. Thank you very much, Ms. Morrison. I reserve the right to recall this witness, Your Honor. Mr. Markham? I have no questions. Ms. Taylor, you work for an airline called Fly West Airlines, yes? That's correct. And what is your job with this company? I'm a reservations clerk. Now, according to your company records in the past several months, did a Ms. Abby Morrison make a reservation to fly from Santa Fe to Denver? Yes, she did. And on what date did she actually fly? On September 14th. That is two days after I called her. And uh, her return flight, uh, what date was that? On October 1st. And that is two days before I met with all the other ex-Ms. Morrisons. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. You've been very helpful. Mr. Todd, you are the landlord at 1400 Morton Street. That's the Ed Brooke Lofts. Yes, sir. 
And did you rent an apartment to Ms. Abby Morrison? Sure did. Do you happen to remember the dates of that rental agreement? She rented from September 14th through October 1st. Did she happen to tell you why she wanted the apartment? She said she was an artist and needed a place to work. Oh, well, didn't that disturb you that she was going to use the apartment as an art studio? No, I told her that if she got paint on the walls or on the floor, she'd have to pay to get it off herself. And did she get any paint on the walls, the floors, or anywhere else? No, I kept checking. By the way, after making this big deal out of being an artist, I never did see any paint in the apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, what about art materials, things like easels, paints, charcoal, uh, finished paintings, things of that sort? No, small. I didn't see any of that. Thank you very much. Been very helpful. No further questions? No questions, Your Honor. Recall Abby Morrison. Ms. Morrison, you have just told us that you were not in Denver earlier this month. Would you now care to change that testimony? All right. I was here. Why did you lie? Because my reason for being here is embarrassing. I'm intrigued. You don't appear to be a person easily embarrassed. I wanted David to help me take my paintings to the museum. Oh, so you came here especially to see David Morrison? Yes, but when I got here, I didn't have the guts to ask him for his help. But you rented an apartment across from his. Why did you do that? I don't know if you can understand this. I wanted to watch him. I wanted to see what he had become. And that's all I did. I just watched him. I never approached him. Mm -hmm. So you went back to Santa Fe, and you used the ticket that my office supplied for you to come back to Denver around the same time that the other wives were arriving. Yes. Ms. Morrison, your Denver landlord has testified that there were no art supplies, no easels, no paintings whatsoever in the Denver apartment. If you were not bringing paintings to Denver, what is it that you expected to show the museum? Artists don't travel with paintings, especially if they're big paintings. We travel with slides. That's what I brought. Ms. Morrison, where were you at the time of David Morrison's murder? I was at the Beekman Hotel, asleep. When you left David Morrison's studio, were you alone? No. I left the studio with the other wives. We went back to the hotel. Then I went to sleep. Do you recognize this woman? No, I don't think so. Ms. Wilson is a maid at the Beekman Hotel. She is prepared to testify that you didn't sleep in your bed that night. I am not on trial here. Your Honor. Ms. Morrison, where were you at the time of David Morrison's murder? Where were you, Ms. Morrison? I spent the night with a friend. May we know the name of this friend? I can't tell you that. Why not? You don't remember? You're unwilling? Why can't we hear the name? He's married. And I love him. And if I were to expose our affair, it would ruin his marriage. It would ruin his life. What is his name? I can't tell you that. Your Honor, will you please tell the witness where this is going? Miss Morrison, you must answer the question or be held in contempt. No. Miss Morrison, this court holds you in contempt. Perhaps after a night in jail, you'll be ready to answer the question. Bailiff? These are hers. Hers, I think. Cutter must be out hunting. Look around, see if you can pick up Cutter's trail. We're gonna talk to Deborah. Okay. Hello, Deborah. Or should I say Margot? You had no business following me here. David Morrison was murdered, and you're involved. That makes you my business. I had nothing to do with David's murder. Then why'd you pretend to be someone else? So I call myself Margo instead of Deborah. So what? I might just call myself something else tomorrow. The blonde wig, the makeup? It's called changing your look, Polanski. All right? Models do it all the time. It's fun. You should try it. Why'd you run? 
Look, Morrison is dead. I lost my job. Why shouldn't I go camping with my boyfriend? Why don't I just get out of here? You know better than that. You're a witness to a murder. Now go pack your things. You're coming with me. I'm not going anywhere with you. Well, you have no choice. <laughs> Charged with obstructing justice, she's coming back with me. I don't think so. You've only got one shot. for the lady. Denver is. Denver is really nice. Oh, it's beautiful. We love it. All right, back to work. Mm -hmm. Abby Morrison, spending the night in jail. <laughs> Anthony, do you think she's really telling the truth about protecting her lover? Not a chance. That's a big baloney story, believe me. <laughs> Stella, where are the police photographs? <clears throat> Right here. What took you so long? <laughs> well, well, well. What do you see? It's what I don't see, Della. Here, look at this. What? See this? Anthony, this is the lady you wanted to meet. And I could use some cash. Come in. Ms. Morrison. I am sure your night in jail is not an experience you want to repeat. So please, make it easy on yourself. Tell us where you were and who you were with at the time of David Morrison's murder. I refuse to answer that question. In that case, Ms. Morrison, the bailiff will return you to jail. Your Honor, if you please, I would like to go past that question so that Ms. Morrison may continue her testimony. The court finds the witness in contempt. But you may continue, Mr. Caruso. Thank you, Your Honor. There is a young woman in this court. I'm asking her to stand. 
Miss Morrison, do you recognize this woman? Yes, she's Margot, David's assistant. When did you meet her? On the first day of shooting. Did you know her before? No. No further questions, Your Honor. I reserve the right to recall this witness. Mr. Markham? No questions, Your Honor. Will you please state your name? Uh, Deborah Walters. Not Margot Rentel? No. And where are you from? Santa Fe, New Mexico. Who are your parents? David Morrison. And Abby Walters Morrison. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Markham? No questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Walters. You may step down. I am recalling Abby Morrison. Ms. Morrison, why did you lie about your relationship with Ms. Walters? My relationship between my daughter and myself is nobody's business but ours. Did David Morrison know he had a daughter? I told him, yes. After your divorce? Yes. And did he believe he had a child? No! He went so far as to accuse me of lying to get him back. Isn't it true that at the time of your divorce, you hated David so much that you never even told him you were pregnant? In other words, it was as if, if I can't have you, you can't have your child. No, that is not true. Did you tell Deborah that David Morrison was her father? Yes, I did. Did you tell Deborah that David Morrison knew he had a daughter, but wasn't interested, didn't care, didn't care if he saw her or spoke to her or anything? I was trying to protect her. David was too selfish to be a father. He would have broken her heart. Two weeks before David was killed, Deborah showed up at David's studio, presented herself as a photographic assistant, and volunteered to work without salary. Was that your idea? Yes, it was. Why the charade? David had cheated me before, and I didn't want him to have the opportunity to do it again. Sweetheart. And I thought, if she was working in David's studio, she would have access to his files and his papers, and we would know if he was really bankrupt or if he was trying to cheat me again. In other words, you sent your daughter to spy on her father. You could call it that. I want to show you something. I'm going to show you a photograph marked Defense Exhibit G. Can you identify it, please? It's David and I on our honeymoon. Mm -hmm. As you can see, David is wearing a silver and turquoise pendant around his neck. Do you recognize it? It's a nausea. It's a Navajo talisman for good luck and prosperity. My grandmother gave it to me, and I gave it to David on our wedding day. The day that David was murdered, your daughter took pictures of you and the other ex-wives at the photographic session, did she not? Yes. David wanted a record of his genius at work. All right. This is one of the pictures that she actually took at the session. Uh, it's uh, Defense Exhibit K, Your Honor. Now, what is David wearing around his neck? The nausea. And David was wearing the nausea the night he was killed. I now show you this photograph, which is People's Exhibit 6. It's a police photograph taken right after David's murder. Do you notice anything unusual about this picture? No. The nausea is missing, and the broken chain is lying next to him on the floor. I don't see anything significant about that. Oh. I think you do. No further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Markham? I have no questions, Your Honor. Recall Deborah Walters, please. Deborah, you staged a scene in the studio that night to give Dee Morrison the impression that you were having an affair with her husband. Why did you do that? <laughs> he was a jerk. He deserved whatever grief I could give him. You hated your father that much. After what he did to me, why wouldn't I hate him? <sighs> Deborah, do you recognize this Nadja that David Morrison is wearing around his neck? 
Yes, it belonged to my great-grandmother. And you know about Navajo legends and culture? I grew up listening to stories about them, yes. So this Naja has great personal meaning for you? Yes. Which is why you took it back after you murdered David Morrison. <laughs> what are you talking about? Deborah, you're wearing a chain around your neck. The end of it is hidden. I want you to show the court what is at the end of that chain. Leave her alone. She Bella, hasn't done anything. Miss Morrison, Miss Morrison, please, 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 please sit down. You'll be ejected from the courtroom and taken to jail. Show the, the court. court what is at the end of that chain. I don't have to do that. Ms. Walters, please show this court what is at the end of that chain. Isn't it true that your mother realized what you were going to do and she raced from her hotel room to try to stop you? I called her and I told her I was going to kill him. She begged me not to. She said she was going to come right up. But she was too late. You had already murdered your father. Yes. But I am not sorry. Because he never... That's what you told me, Mom. He never, he never loved me. Your Honor, in view of this evidence, I ask you to set aside the charges against my client, Dean Morrison. Mr. Markham, the people agree? Mom. The charges against Dean Morrison are dismissed. She Bailiff, please take Miss Walters into custody. This court is adjourned. He loved all of them, but he never loved me. Rise. Ken, Della, really wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Anthony, thank you. D, I have an idea. Wait, don't you want to congratulate her? It's first? my idea. Wait, one at a time. Okay, here it is. We're going to take the negatives from David Shoot and produce the exhibit ourselves. And then do a poster, maybe even a book. What do you think? Well, it would certainly help pay off my debts. Great. Terrific. Oh, Anthony, can you handle the legal work? Pro, Pro bono. bono. Oh, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> D, let's do lunch. Wonderful. Bye-bye, right. <laughs> honey. See you Thank later. Bye. <laughs> uh, oh. David's entrepreneurial spirit lives on. Indeed it does. I think he would really have liked that. This has been an emotional and difficult case. So I'm going to reward us all if with the most wonderful, unforgettable meal if you'll take me to the nearest kitchen you can find. Huh? Oh, no. Not until you sing the song that you sang the first time you came into the office. Oh, that was not just a song. You know what that was? No. That was the first act aria that Alfredo sings to Mimi in La Boheme. Oh, it speaks of love. It speaks of hope. <laughs> Well, you know, politics is a lot like the circus. It's always better to be in front leading the parade than in back sweeping up after the elephants. <laughs> no, no, seriously, seriously, there are no guarantees in this or any other election. Do you think your recent surge in the polls reflects voter interest in your programs or simply a rejection of incumbent Governor Allison? I think it's a little bit of both. I think the voters have taken a look at Governor Allison's record and decided I might do better. This is how much will the voters like you and the program when they see this. Where'd you get this? What is this? That's a press release just issued by a young woman who claims to be your mistress. Now, according to this woman, you and she had an affair while your wife lay dying in a hospital. 
We're waiting for your comment. Mr. Mr. Richards, Richard, do you have a comment on that, Mr. Richards? What is your comment on that? Is it true what they say right there, Mr. Mr. Richards? Mr. Richards? Morning, John. No use campaigning here, Harlan. You already got my vote. Well, I appreciate that. Where's Mackenzie? Roping. Oh. Morning, Bill. Morning, Harlan. Thanks for seeing me, Bill. Yeah. Guess you know why I'm here. I saw the news on the TV. All lies. Didn't have anything to do with that girl. Do you know her? Met her at a fundraiser, had my picture taken with her. Then, you know, she started to call the office, and uh, I didn't feel good about that, so I didn't take the call. Gotta believe me, Bill. Oh, hell, Harlan, I believe you. I don't think you got the imagination to take up with a girl like that. Will you talk to her for me? Just see what it's gonna take to get rid of her. Harlan. I've never cared for your politics. As a matter of fact, I'm voting for Allison. But you've always been straight with me, even when you were the DA. So I'll be glad to look into it for you. Thank you, Bill. Don't thank me yet. I got a feeling this ain't gonna be easy. Hey, Johnny Red. Check it out. Beauty, isn't she? Sure is. Now, what's an old man like you need with a sweet little bike like this? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. I guess I don't rightly know. Except it suits me. I'm sweet myself. You look like a leader to me. You think so? I surely do. So I know I can count on you to guarantee that this bike will look just as sweet when I come back as it does right now. <laughs> sure thing, old man. Appreciate it. You got a lot of faith in me, my friend. Oh, I sure do. I got your watch, too. Miss Moore? I'm Bill McKenzie. I know you. The lawyer, right? You weren't easy to find. You're here to convince me to retract my story. So, what is Harlan offering? He's not offering one thin dime. Just a chance to tell the truth before I have to haul you in court. Harlan Richards had an affair with me. You've seen the picture? Oh, now, Miss Moore used to be the camera never lied, but with the tabloids and all that's over, you could you could take my head and put it on another man's body and swear that I was in love with Saddam Hussein. Just what are you offering? I can't for the life of me figure out why a beautiful and apparently nice young woman like you would want to destroy a man as decent as Harlan Richards, wreck his election, his political future, bring this grief to him and his daughter. Why are you doing this, Miss Moore? I have no choice. You don't. Whatever your personal grudge against him, I feel obliged to warn you that you're committing libel and tampering with the electoral process. Now, Mr. Richards is at this hotel. Here's his number. Please, if you won't talk to me, talk to him.
Where is everybody? Send them all home. Been a long, hard day. Well, I'm afraid I'm not going to make it any easier. I come up dry with Violet Moore. Damn that woman. She's lying. Why is she doing this to me? Uh, she wouldn't say, but whoever put her up to it, planted a tape recorder in her purse, they're not going to give up, Harlan. Now, you listen to him, Daddy. Hi. Bill, any luck with her yet? Afraid not. I tell you, you give me five minutes alone with that Miss Violet Moore, and I'll get the truth out of her. Now, Karen, you're a loyal daughter, and I admire your spirit, but that's a wretched idea, and you know it. Well, what are we supposed to do? All I can do is stand by my denial and continue the campaign. You saw today's polls. Unless we do something, we are going to lose. Then we lose. I'm real sorry about all this. Enough to vote for me? <laughs> you take care. You too, Karen. Thanks. Oh, I... <clears throat> Harlan Richards. This is, uh, Violet Moore. What is it, Ms. Moore? Look, I've been thinking things over, and I've decided that I, I really can't go through with this frame-up thing. Mr. Richards, it's just not right. I'm very relieved, Miss Moore. Are you willing to make a public retraction? Uh, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, it would be a little chancy. Who put you up to this, Miss Moore? You know what? I really can't get into this over the phone. See, if they found out that I called you, well, I don't know what they do. Miss Moore, if you'll come forward and tell your story, I guarantee you my protection. I tell you what, I could meet you tomorrow morning uh, at 8, say, um, in your hotel, in the coffee shop. I'll be there. Okay. I didn't hear you come in. Hi. out the window you wouldn't have done that bill i know let let me sort this out with the sergeant can you sit over here for a minute yeah be all right here yeah all right bad business joe what'd you find nothing complicated he opened the window and jumped out just like that just like that come on karen you come back to the ranch with me. I just, I don't understand it, Bill. Neither do I. We interrupt this program for a special news brief. Here's Dale Scott. The medical examiner's office has officially concluded the gubernatorial candidate Harlan Richards' death was suicide. Richards was recently accused by a former campaign worker, Violet Moore, of having an affair with her, and she was charging him with sexual harassment. Apparently distraught over the scandal, Mr. Richards jumped from his hotel room window, dying instantly. State political experts agree that the death of Harlan Richards guarantees the re-election of his opponent, incumbent governor Ryan Allison. We'll have more on the death of Harlan Richards, including reactions from around the country. 
I might as well say what everybody's thinking. Congratulations on the second term, Governor Allison. We lucked out. I didn't want it this way. Everybody knows that, Ryan. Dan, you keep quiet about luck. Folks will think we're dancing on Harlan's grave. Lighten up, Al. This is good news for us all, so why not admit it? Yeah, it's a gift horse. Why well, look at the mouth? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you for four months i need your help do i look like i can help anybody my father didn't commit suicide he was murdered and whoever put you up to framing him is behind it i'm sorry you're wasting your time who used you to make it look like my father had a reason to kill himself i need to know what you know look lady i got enough trouble see just leave me alone i'll make it worth your while leah how much Fifty thousand in advance. And I'll tell you what I know. I can get you fifty thousand dollars. Now you tell me what happened. First I get my money. I'll tell you this much. The frame up, your father's death. It was all about getting Allison elected governor. You get me my money. See? And I'll tell you something even better. You slept so late. It's eight o'clock. Yeah, that's what I mean. Afraid that just cold cereal cooks off of the flu. Oh, then I'm cooking lunch. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Della. Good morning, Bill. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us. Oh, the branch is beautiful, and the sky is incredible. Oh, I knew you'd take to it, Della. Lord knows you need a vacation. <laughs> you too. Trip, where are you out? You want to just rest today. No, sir. You promised me ranching, and that's why I'm here. Good man. <laughs> oh, oh, Bill. How many for lunch, and what time do you want it? Uh, just the ranch hands and us. Twelve o'clock. There'll be fifteen. Yeah. Uh, oh, great, great. Uh, microwave in the kitchen? Oh, I never use a makes food taste like the Sunday paper. Uh, oh, I like real home cooking, Della. Yes. The stores are in the basement. Ken, I'll see you at the uh, stable. <laughs> Doesn't have a microwave. Uh-huh, 15 for lunch. I bet enough food for 15. Well, you had to volunteer. <laughs> While you're here roasting an entire cow, I'll be out on the range riding horses. Most of the men who settled these parts, including my daddy, came here young and illiterate. <laughs> so they developed terrific... <laughs> Memories and powers of observation. They could tell stories they heard 50 years ago. And track strays across a high rock country. That's lunch. Boys got racing blood. Okay, boys. Right. Anybody there for second? Come on back up. All right, help yourself. How about some bread here? You want bread? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Good. Looks mighty fine, Della. 
Ranch hands eat like they're going to be hung in the morning, don't they? <sighs> they don't even chew. No, <laughs> just swallow. <laughs> ah, time for lunch, Karen. Uh, Della, this is a good friend of mine, Karen Richards. This is Della Street, Karen, the best city lady I know. Oh, Bill, thank Bill's you. told me all about you. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Nice to see you, John. Um, Bill, could we talk? Sure thing. Excuse us. Certainly, dear. Uh. It's Harlan Richards' daughter. I know. Poor thing. So, uh, this is all about getting Allison reelected? That's what Viola said. Well, tracking down Violet Moore was good detective work, Karen, but I don't like that part about the money. Yeah, uh, well, I was hoping I could borrow it from you. Well, boy, that's quite a lot of money. Bill, I will pay you back every penny, I promise, as soon as the estate settles. Well, even if you do pay her, uh, how do you know this woman is going to keep up her end of the bargain? Why don't you go back and stay at your daddy's ranch and let me look into this? Fine. If you don't want to help me, loan me the money. Ooh. I will take it up with the governor myself. Ooh, Karen. I'm sorry I bothered you. Now, don't go getting reckless. Great first session, the governor. Oh, thanks, Bobby. Hey, you work on mending those political fences back home. Well, yeah, I'm going to need you next <laughs> session. <laughs> Lots of All success right. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Got the whole legislature eating out of your hands. You sure know how to work them. I meant what I said. Bobby's a good man. And I don't work people out. How long are you going to be in Washington? Sorry, miss. I well, I'll leave this evening and... He will see me. I think we need to talk, Governor. Karen, I don't think this is the time or the place. Oh. Then when is it? Your office keeps putting me off. Well, I wasn't aware of that. You call me next week. We'll get together. No, I think we'll talk right now. I know what you've done. You created this whole Violet Moore scandal. My father didn't commit suicide. He was murdered, and you're behind it. Listen, I know you're upset, and you don't know what you're saying. So you think about this, and you call me when you can talk rationally. Rationally? You're a liar! Hey, 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 hey. hey. Have her arrested for attempted assault and battery. Oh, no, that's all right. Karen, I'm sorry you're feeling this way, huh? Come on, just get her out of here. Just get her out. It's not going to be this easy, Governor. You're going to pay, I swear it! Governor Allison, what are you doing here? You'll miss your plane. Oh, uh, something's come up, Rosemary. I'm not going to Washington. But for right now, I don't want to tell anyone I'm in town. Well, what is it? I'll help you. Oh, that's very kind of you, Rosemary, but this is private. I've got to make some calls, see some people, and uh, if you just place the calls, you can leave. Whatever you say, Governor. Hello? This is Governor Allison. Um, I'd like to speak with you privately. If you think you can talk me into shutting up, you are wrong. Karen, I have questions of my own about your father's death. I want to hear what you know and investigate further. Are you trying to tell me you had nothing to do with this? Well, I didn't expect you to believe me, but I may have an idea who did this. You come to my office at 10 o'clock. I'll leave the side door open. I'll be waiting. We have a lot to talk about. Governor Allison? Governor.
Sit down before you wear his bow tie. When you got to the governor's office, did you see anyone else? No. The state house was deserted. Except for the security guard who found me in Allison's office. Was anyone leaving the building when you went in? No. Why? Well, I got bad news for you, so I'll give it to you straight. Governor Allison's wife, Emily, claims she was with her husband in his office till 10 o'clock last night. She says he was alive and well when she left him, and she saw you coming in the building as she was going out. That is a damn lie. She wasn't there. Well, the police don't believe her, do they? Right now, it's your word against hers. Violet admitted that Allison was involved in my father's death. And now I'm being framed for exposing the truth. I... My father's murder and Allison's are connected. That could well be. But right now, we got our hands full with this one case. Now, if we try playing more than one hand at a time, we're going home with our pockets empty. You understand? Yeah. But I don't like it. We'll see what we can do about that. Got her out on bail. Sent her over to her daddy's ranch till the hearing. They find prints? Yeah, including Karen's on the murder weapon. There's a letter opener. She must have touched it when she found him. Sounds like you got your hands full with this one. Like swatting flies. Della? You. Come sit and have coffee. Bill, did you ever think about getting a dishwasher? Oh, waste of water, <laughs> waste of electricity. You still have to scrub the pots. Mm -hmm. It sure is nice of you to pitch in, though. <laughs> Glad to help. Ken, Ken, <laughs> my foreman tells me that you did yourself proud this morning. You never tried branding cattle before, did you? Never saw one outside of a movie. They sure kick a lot, don't they? Oh, worse than mules. One of them get you. Uh, I'm fine, really. <laughs> well, I'm sure gonna hate to leave you two out here all by yourself, but I... I gotta move into town for the duration. Uh, gotta be near my office. Bill, uh, about your case, Del and I want to help out. Oh, oh, absolutely. Oh, well, I, I could use your help, but I promise you two weeks out here on the ranch. Oh, well, we, we've really had great fun, Bill, but uh, uh, it, it just... Show me your files. No use arguing, Bill. We insist. Okay. I'll book rooms for you at the hotel, then. You sure you wouldn't rather stay out here on the ranch and have fun? Morning, Joe. Thought your breakfast might have wore off by now. Coffee, donuts, chips. Fred, coffee break, courtesy of Mr. McKenzie. Joe, Ken Melansky. Good investigator. Works for Perry Mason. Sergeant Joe Whitehorse, Ken. Nice to meet you, Sergeant. Oh. Find anything? We found a letter from Miss Richards typed on her hotel stationery. It's a threat to the governor. Exactly. What does it say? That unless the governor admits his responsibility for the murder of her father, the same thing will happen to him. A typed letter? That's a frame-up, Joe. Maybe. But you know the prosecution is going to call it key evidence. Yeah. Place is all yours. Enjoy your stay, Mr. Molaski. How did he know what was in that bag? There's Navajo. We can smell right through plastic containers, even when they're sealed. Or maybe it's because I always bring him coffee, donuts, and chips. What's bothering you? Let's get our own photographer in here. Take a look around, see if anything catches your eye. Well, yes, I think so too. Thank you, thank you very much. Bill McKenzie, you should be ashamed of yourself. Defending Karen Richards? Governor Allison was a good man. He was a great man. That nothing girl just cut him down. She's innocent, Miss Sutter, or I wouldn't be here. 
You can't really believe that. I believe it. I mean to prove it. Any idea why Governor Allison canceled his trip to Washington? No. He didn't confide in me. What was he doing here in his office that night? Do, do you know? Yes, he was talking to your Miss Richards. I placed the call myself. Did he tell you what that call was about? I assume that he was telling her to come to her senses and stop making all those crazy accusations. He would do that, you know. Give someone a chance to back off. Hmm. Instead, she killed him. So, you didn't actually hear the phone conversation? I'm not in the habit of listening to the governor's phone conversations. Oh, no offense, Miss Sutter. I, I just had to ask. Did the governor make any other phone calls that night? A few. I'd be much obliged if you give me those names. Here's his phone log. Uh-huh. So, let me see now. These people all knew that the governor was in his office that night and not on a plane to Washington. Well, that makes them all suspects, Miss Sutter. Does that include me? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Thank you, Miss Sutter. Now, the names on that phone log were the only people who knew the governor would be in his office that night. Dan Dixon. Mm, old political hack. He's been Speaker of the House since I was in diapers. John Orlando. Lieutenant Governor, smooth, slick. Uh, he came into office with Allison. Al Reinhardt. Young, aggressive, win at all costs. And Mrs. Emily Allison. <laughs> Professional, sweet, young thing. Now, Della, I'd be much obliged if you would dig real deep into their backgrounds. Shouldn't be too difficult. They're all public figures. Well, I can tell you plenty. Well, it's the private stuff we need. You know, the skeletons rattling around in their closets. This woman, Violet Moore, you told me about, is she still using the name Charlotte Webb and stripping in the same club? I don't know. Good question, Ken. Find Violet Moore. Now, uh, Karen, we're going to go over that night once more. Again? From the beginning. Excuse me. You know where I can find the owner? Who wants to know? Name's Melansky. I'm working with Bill McKenzie. I'm looking for Charlotte Webb. Well, you came to the wrong place. She up and quit. Could I trouble you for Charlotte's home? Home address? Oh, it's no trouble. I ain't got it. Well, it'll probably be on her employment application if you could just look it up for me. Why don't you just uh, talk to my personal secretary? <laughs> I think we could probably, uh, probably work something out here. You know, it's... Uh... had a run-in with a guy named Melansky. He knows about Violet.
Looking for something. Who are you? My name is Molansky. I'm a friend of Charlotte Webb's. Rang the front bell, but nobody answered. I ain't hear no bell. Maybe it's broken. I'm looking for Charlotte. You know where I can find her? Right this minute. I suppose she's off somewhere doing something she likes. And you? You like throwing clothes around a room? Violet asked me to pack some of her things, and uh, I'm afraid I'm not too tidy. And I'm afraid you're not telling the truth. I'm afraid you're right. Thank you, miss. Ah, Mr. McKenzie, what can I do for you? Uh, I guess you know I'm representing Karen Richards. I've heard, and I won't hold it against you, but I will tell you straight out. That girl killed the best man who ever lived. Well, I'm aware that you and Allison were close. We were partners in our law firm, Allison and Reinhardt, until Ryan was elected governor. Now, Allison called you the night he was murdered. Uh, what, what do you want? Just to bounce around a couple ideas he had about the next session of legislature. That was the last time I spoke to Ryan. Uh, forgive me if some of these questions are a little painful. There was an incident about a year ago. Uh, you and your wife uh, were at a party where Allison was over imbibing in some of his favorite sipping whiskey. The three of you left together, and on the way home there was an accident, and your wife was killed. Is that right? That is right. I'm sorry. The way I hear it, you were so taken up with grief you couldn't work for a couple of months. No, Ryan kindly gave me a leave of absence. Now, you and Allison both reported that you were the one driving that night, that you hadn't been drinking, so you took the wheel. Well, that's exactly what happened. Officially, yeah, but the rumor circling around town is that Allison was driving drunk. And that uh, you took the blame because if he'd been charged with a drunk driving felony, he'd never been elected. That's not a rumor. That's a lie spread by Ryan's political enemies, and you shouldn't listen to them. I try not to. Well, then why are you bringing it up? What does that accident have to do with Ryan's murder? It could make you a suspect. Me? That is a libelous and malicious accusation, sir. It's not an accusation. Oh, I'm just supposing. I don't make accusations I can't back up. Then use your head, man. If I was so loyal to Governor Allison that I take the blame for an accident he caused, why would I turn around and kill him, hmm? I don't have the answer to that. But one answer might be that uh, once Allison was reelected and you didn't need him anymore, you could do what you wanted to all along. Kill the man who caused your wife's death. Just suppose. I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Lie still, something might be busted. Do you want me to call 911? They'll be here in a flash. Uh, all right. I think. Those guys that were here, where'd they go? I don't know. When I got here, you were alone. You mind telling me what's going on? First, my name's Ken Melansky. Hello. Hello, Jennifer Taylor. I live here. What are you doing here? I'm looking for Charlotte Webb. Oh, we're roommates. Just for the last few months. Before her, I roomed with a fella named Ted. Took off with my stereo. Looks like you have bad luck with roommates. Charlotte isn't Charlotte, she's Violet Moore, the woman who got Harlan Richards involved in a sex scandal. You mean I've been sleeping under the same roof as a celebrity and I didn't even know? Are you a reporter? Ask me anything. She always drank Diet Cola for breakfast. Look, I'm not a reporter. I'm looking for Violet because she's in trouble. Somebody's after her. You mean bad guys? Well, they're not Boy Scouts. Charlotte, I mean Violet. She's in real trouble. I have to find her before they do. Can you help me, Jennifer? You kidding? Look, I work down at So and Safe. You know, 17 locations throughout the state to serve your homemaking needs. Help you save a celebrity from bad guys? Life don't get more exciting. Let's hope not. 
What can you tell me about Violet? She was a cat in a room full of rocking chairs, always about to fly out of her skin. Then, last night, she tells me she's going to check into a motel for a couple of nights. She doesn't say why. Wants me to come back and pack up her stuff and bring it to her. That's why I came home early. Well, where is this motel? I'll show it to you. Well, why not tell me? No, sir. When reporters come around hunting down this story, I want to know what happened. You'll probably wind up on a roll, though. Come on, let's go. Wait till the girls at the sew and save hear about this. Hey. Why don't you put a sign up out there in that parking lot warning folks about the fresh asphalt? I could have ruined my best boots. <laughs> Guess the state expects folks to know that every time the thermometer hits 90 degrees, it gets a little sticky. Well, let me have some newspaper, will you? Great blue salted snakes. <laughs> uh, oh, you want to drink McKinney? No, no, no. Uh, just uh, let, let me have some paper. I want to clean my boots. Uh, we can reschedule. No, no, let's get on with it. Now, look, uh, the governor called you uh, the night he was killed, so that means you knew he wasn't going to Washington. Oh, of course I knew. The governor never changed plans without informing me first. Now, we were friends as well as colleagues. Now, I reckon you need all the friends you can get when you're being investigated by the State Ethics Committee. <laughs> oh, now, Mr. McKenzie. You don't want to believe all that talk about not taking bribes. You're savvy enough to know that those charges are trumped up by my political opponents. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> that sounds like a campaign speech to me. <laughs> Allison always sided you against your opponents, didn't he? Until lately. Right to the end. He was always standing right there beside me. Officially, yeah. But uh, I've been going over all the governor's press statements about you, and I don't believe he ever once said that you didn't do anything wrong. Just said he wouldn't interfere with the investigating committee. Well, that was the proper thing for him to do. But not too supportive. Just what is your point, Mr. McKinley? My point is this. If Allison were still alive, you'd be out there alone now, twisting in the wind. You're saying Ryan's death benefits me? Well, everybody knows you and Lieutenant Governor Orlando are close. Now he's the governor. And I see by this morning's paper that your investigation's been put on hold. Now, isn't that coincidental? Doesn't that give you a pretty good motive for murder? <laughs> you know, LPJ used to spin out stories like that. All speculation, what ifs. <laughs> Some folks... I took offense, but I always found it delightful. You know, imagination makes a politician interesting. But I never did like it very much in a lawyer, concerned as he should be with the facts. Now, the night Ryan Allison died, he gave me his solemn promise that he'd stand by me in my committee fight. Your voice is sincere. Your smile is steady, and you look a man straight in the eyes when you're making a point. If I was a voter, I'd be downright dazzled. Instead, I'm sitting here trying to figure out whether what you're telling me is a God's honest truth or an LBJ story. I'll try to take that as a compliment, Mr. McKenzie. Now, that promise he made, the one he gave you the night you met him in his office. Uh, no, no, no. I... I never did see the governor that night. I only spoke to him on the phone. I spent most of that evening taking my ease at the Cattlemen's Club, where I've been a member for years. Join me there for dinner some night. Anything else I can do to help you? You don't clean boots, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dixon, I'm sure we'll be speaking again. Number two. Oh, my God. Bird's <gasps> dead. Oh, my God. Oh. Wait here.
Sundown Motel, room number two. Yes, Violet Moore. Yes, she's dead. Look, I gotta get back there. Molansky, Ken Molansky. M-A-L, just like it sounds. What's going on, Sergeant? You reported a murder, Mr. Molansky. Yeah, Violet Moore. Where's Jennifer? I arrived here with Jennifer Taylor, her roommate. Miss Moore was dead on the floor, shot by the look of it. Saw a man go out the bathroom window, pursued him, he got away. Will you step this way? After you. Where's the body? Where's Jennifer? Not here. We checked every room in the motel. No sign of Violet Moore or anything that looks like a murder. I don't get it. <laughs> this is your idea of a joke, Mr. Milansky? This is no joke. Then get some rest, Mr. Milansky. Please forgive me for intruding, Ms. Allison. Oh. It's got to be a very, very hard time for you. Well, would you like some coffee? No, thank you, ma'am. Um, something stronger? No, I'm fine. No? All right, please. Thank you. We're never prepared for things like this, are we? Murder. It happens to other people. People we don't know. I still expect Ryan to come through that door. Yes, ma'am. His friends and colleagues have been so wonderful to me. They've sent letters and cards and stopped by to see me. I've given each one of them something of Ryan's to remember him by. Well, uh, wasn't that thoughtful? How can you defend Karen Richards? I know who you are and I know what people say about you. I thought you were an honorable man. I'm a particular man, Mrs. Allison, and a fortunate one. I'm not obliged to defend anybody that I don't believe to be innocent. Karen Richards is innocent. Why did you come here? I need to ask you a few questions, and uh, you don't have to respond, of course, but I thought maybe the answers might come easier here in the comfort of your home than in court. Questions? The night your husband was killed, can you tell me what you did and saw? I went to Ryan's office, and I was with him from 9.30 to just before 10. When did you see Miss Richards? As I was driving away from the state house. From the parking lot? Yes. Well, you must have got a good look at her. That lot's very brightly lit. That's right. Well, how come you saw her and she didn't see you? Maybe she was so intent on killing my husband, she didn't notice me or anything else. She looked furious. Uh, Are there any other questions, Mr. McKenzie? No, ma'am. Oh, you've been most helpful. <laughs> you seriously think I killed my husband? I know Karen Richards didn't. What possible motive would I have? Well, I've been asking myself that very question, and I'm stumped. Good day, Miss Allison. Excuse me. I was wondering if you know your neighbor, Charlotte Webb? Oh, sure. Pretty girl. We ain't spoke, but we've waved. Uh, what about a roommate, Jennifer Taylor? She ain't got a roommate. This pretty girl. Brown hair about this tall? Nope, never seen her. Excuse me, I got washed soaking. 
Mind you, don't forget my flower box. I know her. Jennifer Taylor. Yeah, I've seen her coming and going over at Charlotte's. I've seen her where she works. You frequent the sewing safe. Drifters. Strip club. Jennifer strips there? You seen her? Every chance I get. Thanks. McKinsey's dug up enough dirt to bury us all. Maybe you, buddy. I'm clean as a whistle. Save the pious act for the voters. Hell, I know better. Are you accusing me of something, Dan? Gentlemen, gentlemen, let's not shoot ourselves in the foot arguing. All this is going to turn out just fine so long as we stick together. Ah, uh, excuse me. Uh, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I, did, I didn't see a, a secretary out here. Mr. McKenzie, what a pleasure. Uh, Come right in. Uh, Please, sit down. Uh, sir, I... <laughs> You caught us smack in the middle of a policy meeting. Oh, well, that's some job you fellas have. Try and figure out what the voters want and then giving it to them. <laughs> that's what politicians do, Mr. McKenzie. Oh, I used to think so. Oh, sounds like you don't care for politicians. Oh, I do some. Yeah, Lincoln was a politician and Jefferson and a few others. Of course, we haven't seen their like in some time, but uh, with a little luck, uh, we will again someday. In the meantime, you're busy trying to destroy this administration. You misread me, gentlemen. All I'm after here is the truth. So if whichever one of you fellas killed the governor will just step forward, then we'll be done with it. <clears throat> I've got work to do. Talk to you later, John. Hmm. You don't really believe one of them did it. I believe Karen Richards didn't. What about me? You think I did it? Allison's dead and you're the governor. Isn't that what you always wanted? Fake, Mr. McKenzie. Could be. <laughs> Can you tell me where you were the night Allison was killed? Surely. I was at a fundraising dinner at the Drake Hotel from about 7 till midnight. Governor Allison called me there about 9. You didn't go to the state house to see him that night? No, we just spoke on the phone. You're welcome to check that with the folks at the fundraiser. All 250 of them. I will, Governor. <laughs> I'll check them all. Yes, I do believe you will. In that case, there is something I should add. Yeah. During the course of that evening, I met a young lady, very attractive, keen interest in politics, we went upstairs to my hotel suite where we spent an hour in private. You understand, Mr. McKenzie, that no gentleman would reveal that young lady's name. Wouldn't dream of asking, Mr. Orlando. So, you can't prove that you were at that fundraiser the whole evening, is that it? Maybe not, but you can't prove I wasn't. <laughs> where have you been? Why weren't you at your desk? Uh, Mr. McKenzie told me he wanted a cup of coffee, so I had to go all the way down to the commissary oh, to get thank it. thank you, thank you. I'll drink this on the way out. Thank you. Did I do anything wrong? I don't know if Jennifer's alive or dead. All I know is that she worked at the strip club. Well, that neighbor saw her coming and going at Violet Moore's, and maybe she lives somewhere else. And her real address would probably be on file at the strip club. The owner, Donovan, may be waiting for you. Probably. Well, let me take a run at it. Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, come here. Give Dell a hand sorting through these police reports. <laughs> here you are. Live dangerously. <laughs> I'm Bill McKenzie. I need to get a look at Jennifer Taylor's employment file. Well, forget about it. You're not getting nothing but right out of here. Hey, Will. Hey! I warned you. Take care of him, Will. Yes, sir. Oh, 
Are you okay, Mr. McKenzie? Yeah, I'm fine, Well, How are you? You and your brother stand out of trouble. When you got my kid brother off on that murder rap, I promised you that I'd keep us both clean. Good man. Give me a hand here, Will. See if you can find an address on Jennifer Taylor. Sure, Mr. McKenzie. Yeah, I'll make it sound good. Oh! oh. Nice work, Will. friend of Jennifer Taylor's I tried knocking but I guess she's not there any idea where she is uh, she just said she had to go away for a couple of days I said I feed her cat <laughs> how do you like that she left already I guess that's why she left a message for me to check on the cat there's nothing wrong with the cat did you feed it I was just going to I think I better have a look it's like I got here just in time this cat's in terrible shape I fed it yesterday yesterday this is a pedigreed Balkanese. Pedigreed? Yeah, this is one meal. It throws his whole metabolism off. Do you have any idea what a cat like this cost? I, I thought it was just a uh, stray. Yeah, well, if people knew what this cat was worth, it wouldn't be safe. Look, if, if you got things to do, I can take it from here. It's OK, sweetheart. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, sure. Look, you need anything, let me know. Yeah. What happened next, Sergeant Whitehorse? After we received the call. Oh, I had a notion or two she thought it was worth checking. That lady worked too hard. When we arrived at the governor's office, we found him dead from an apparent stab wound to the chest. Who else was present? A security guard and Miss Richards. I show you People's Exhibit 15. Have you seen this before, Sergeant? Yes. Where was that? I discovered it while conducting an examination of the crime scene. The governor's office? Yes. Will you read that letter to the court? I won't let you get away with what you've done. Either you clear my father's name, or I swear you'll pay. Will you read the signature, please? Karen Richards. I never wrote that. I know. No further questions. Mr. McKenzie? Uh, Mr. Whitehorse, uh, was that letter handwritten or typed? The letter was typed. And the signature? Typed. And you have no knowledge that Karen Richards typed it, do you? No, sir. Now, Sergeant, uh, I'll call your attention to uh, People's Exhibit 13 and ask if you can identify it. Yes, it, it has my mark. Is this the murder weapon that killed Governor Allison? Yes, sir, it is. I have no further questions. I'm telling you, Miss Taylor never got her prescription. You filled it yourself. Okay, well, listen, make sure it goes out this afternoon. Now, she's staying at a friend's. Do you have the address? 1414 Mesa, that's right. So you got a clear look at the defendant? Yes, I did. She practically ran into me. She was in such a hurry. Did she appear upset? She looked like she was in a rage. Did you attempt to stop her? Well, I never dreamed she could get past our security. No further questions. That is a total lie. Yes, I know. Uh, no questions, but defense reserves the right to recall this witness at a later time. The people rest. Call your first witness, Mr. McKenzie. 
Uh, I call Rosemary Sutter to the stand. Now, uh, Miss Sutter, would you tell us what duties you performed as Governor Allison's executive assistant? I was responsible for his schedule, his travel arrangements, his speaking engagements, his daily agenda. I screened and placed all his phone calls. I took dictation and I processed his mail. W would it be right to say that on a day-to-day -day basis you looked after the governor's life? I only did what an executive's assistant does, Mr. McKenzie. Oh, I think you're being too modest. Miss Sutter, didn't people around the governor keep telling him how lucky he was to have an executive assistant as devoted as you? I took my work seriously, if that's what you mean. Uh, you say that you process the governor's mail. Does that mean you opened and read it? Yes, generally. The only exception would be letters marked personal. Did you open and read this letter, uh, People's Exhibit 15, uh, allegedly sent by Karen Richards and written on stationery from the Stanford Hotel? No, I did not. This letter was marked personal. However, the day the governor received it, he showed it to me. The letter disturbed him. And for good reason, as it turns out. Uh, Your Honor, move to strike all the witnesses' response after the word no. Granted. It shall be stricken. Now, the day after the murder, you went over to the Stanford Hotel, didn't you? I did not. The desk clerk at the hotel is present in this courtroom, Mr. Butler. Uh, Mr. Butler is ready to testify that the morning after Governor Allison was killed, he saw you in the hotel lobby. Now, what were you doing there, Miss Sutter? The press was all over me at the State House, demanding that I make a statement. They wouldn't let me alone. I needed some peace and quiet, so I went over to the hotel for breakfast. The same hotel that Karen Richards had uh, stayed in. You know what I think, Miss Sutter? I think that you went over to the Stanford Hotel for the express purpose of getting some of this hotel stationery, and then you typed this threatening letter over Miss Richards' name. Now, if you like, I can produce expert testimony that this letter was typed on your typewriter. Am I right about that, Miss Sutter? Your Honor, would you please direct the witness to answer the question? Miss Sutter? I didn't want the press or the police to go snooping into the governor's private affairs. Starting rumors about him, creating scandal. So, you were being loyal to the governor when you wrote this letter, weren't you? It seemed obvious to me that Karen Richards had killed him. I was just trying to protect his name. Is that so bad? Did you write this letter? Yes, I did. Thank you, Miss Sutter.
It astounds me. Any guy can come in off the street, break into your house. I mean, what is the world coming to? I'm looking for Jennifer Taylor. I don't know anybody by that name. Mr. Steele, her prescription was delivered here. What are you, a cop? You broke into my house and you're asking me questions? You got a lot of nerve. So do you. Yeah, she was here with me. She lived here, but then I kicked her out. You know why? Because she was sloppy and a loser. Anything else? Do you know where she went? I have no idea and I couldn't care less. Is that about it? Get him out of here. Thanks for your hospitality. The defense calls Governor John Orlando to the stand. You are the governor of this state, are you not, Governor Orlando? Yes, I am. And just how did you become governor? As lieutenant governor, I was sworn in after Governor Allison was murdered. If you would kindly tell us where you were the night Governor Allison was murdered. I was at the Drake Hotel attending a political fundraiser. Now, at this fundraiser, did you run into uh, anyone besides other politicians? A young woman, perhaps? Yes, I did. She approached me, told me she was interested in politics, and asked if we could talk in private. Did you agree to that? Of course. Why wouldn't I? Where did this private conversation take place? Upstairs in my hotel suite. In the living room of my hotel suite. I am a bachelor, Mr. McKenzie. I'm allowed to entertain young ladies as best I can. Now, you live two blocks away from the Drake Hotel. Why would you book a hotel room so close to your home? Well, very often during political functions, it's convenient to have a suite for private discussions. Do you recall what time you and the young lady went upstairs? I'd say between 9.30 and 10. And what time did she leave? I don't really recall. That late? Governor Orlando, what was this young woman's name? Mr. McKenzie, I cannot compromise her by revealing her name. Oh, I understand. In that case, I have no further questions. Uh, no questions, Your Honor. Defense calls as its next witness, Robert Fowler. Uh, Mr. Fowler, will you tell us what you do for a living? I'm a waiter employed by the Drake Hotel. And were you on duty the night Governor Allison was killed? Yes. Uh, I was working room service that night. And on that night, did you have occasion to deliver room service room 228? Yeah. Um, Governor Orlando ordered uh, champagne, and I delivered it to his suite. What time was that? About a quarter to ten. Now, while you were in this hotel suite, did you see anyone else besides the governor? No, but... Uh, I knew there was a woman in the room. How'd you know that? Well, I saw a lady's suit jacket uh, tossed over the back of a chair. It was gray and had a, a watch hanging on the lapel. Oh. What kind of a watch? A watch in an antique gold setting. Uh, had roses on it. it. Looked very old. Maybe Edwardian. Why? Are you, are you an expert on antique jewelry? Not exactly, but my father was a jeweler, so I always noticed nice pieces like that. Antique lapel watch. Now, would you be able to recognize this watch if you saw it again? Sure. I've never seen anything like it. If the court please, I would ask Mrs. Emily Allison to stand. Objection, Your Honor. I don't see the relevancy. Mr. McKenzie, what's this all about? Your Honor, there are several people who had reason to wish Governor Allison dead besides Miss Richards. In a, a matter as grave as this, I would ask for the widest possible latitude. I assure Your Honor that this pursuit is not frivolous. You may proceed. Objection overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Allison. Mrs. Allison. Thank you. So that Mr. Fowler can get a better look at that lapel watch you're wearing. Now, Mr. Fowler, take your time. Is this the same watch that you saw in the hotel suite that night? The same. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. No more questions? No questions. Defense calls Emily Allison to the stand. 
Uh, Mrs. Allison, you've heard uh, Mr. Fowler's testimony. Now, remembering that you're under oath, were you the woman in the hotel suite with Governor Orlando that night? Yes, I was. What were you doing there with the governor? I don't think that's anyone's business. Oh, Mrs. Allison, I have no interest whatever in your personal life, but your actions on the night of the murder are of a considerable importance given your earlier testimony. Now, how long were you in that hotel suite with the governor? I don't recall. What if I told you that I could produce a witness who would swear that you were there for over an hour? That's possible. Now, in your earlier testimony, you stated that you went to your husband's office the night he was killed and stayed with him till almost 10 o'clock. Am I correct? Yes. Yet we now know you were with Governor Orlando at that hour. You also stated that as you left the State House, you saw Karen Richards going in. Am I correct? Yes. Now that your memory has had time to sort itself out, Mrs. Allison, would you like to reconsider your testimony? I was mistaken. I didn't see Karen Richards that evening. Because you weren't there. No more questions. No questions. I called Dan Dixon to the stand. Mr. Dixon, did you speak to Governor Allison the night he was killed? Yes, I did. I spoke to him on the phone. Not face to face in his office? I was at the Cattlemen's Club all night, uh, well, till almost midnight. Well, now that's an interesting point, uh, Mr. Dixon. On the day Governor Allison was killed, a legislature adjourned after everybody left. Maintenance men filled in a lot of potholes in the parking lot with fresh asphalt. Late that night, the asphalt was still soft. Now, if I told you that the imprint of your tire tread was found in that asphalt, Mr. Dixon, could that freshen up your recollection? No, I might have driven over there the next morning. Oh, no. The asphalt was hard in the morning. You were there that night, weren't you? I went there to ask him to back me against the committee that's investigating me. So... You were alone with Governor Allison in his office that night, distraught over the possible ruination of your career, and you want us to believe that you did not have the motive and the opportunity to kill him? I wasn't alone. I brought someone with me. Who was that? Uh, Mr. Clayton Morley. He's the contractor who's been accused of making payoffs to get state business thrown his way. Well, he wanted to make his appeal to the governor in person. So he went in with me, and he came out with me. Uh, bring him in and ask him. Nothing further. Uh, no questions. Court is adjourned until tomorrow at 9 a.m. How's our side doing? Oh, we're holding our own. Just hang in there. What's going on? Well, we knocked down Emily Allison's testimony, but since she wasn't there, she couldn't have killed him. Orlando's a liar, but now he's got an alibi. So is Dixon. I don't think Rosemary Sutter did it, so... Reinhardt is our only suspect. I'll be doggone if I know how to prove it. I think you can. I've got something. Mr. Steele is expecting me. Johnny, it's been a while. Let's make it fast, my friend, because in a minute I'm going to kick you off my spread. I know you're hiding this girl for the life of me. I don't know why. But unless you produce her, I'll be back in an hour with a warrant for your arrest. For what? Obstruction of justice. Obstruction of justice. Listen, cowboy, you'll never make it stick. 
You're concealing a witness crucial to a murder investigation. That's a chargeable offense. Now make sure it sticks. Bill! Look what I found. I thought you were dead. That death was set up so we'd stop looking for her. You gotta come with us, miss. She doesn't have to go with anybody, do you, sweetheart? You made sexual accusations against Harlan Richards, so his death would look like a suicide, but you and I know better about that, don't we, Miss Moore? I know. Violet. You want Karen Richards convicted, Miss Moore, for a murder she didn't commit? You got one death on your conscience, you want two? Violet, would you wait for me in the study, please? You like being pushed around by this fellow, Miss Moore? You're gonna live this way the rest of your life? Is what he wants more important than doing right? Johnny. Did you ever really love me? Sure I loved you, huh? And I treated you okay. Getting her hooked on drugs was okay. Nobody can hook anybody on drugs. They do it to themselves. But you knew when you threw me out of the house what? that time that I would do anything for money. Anything for you. Including lie about having an affair with Harlan Richards, didn't you? You're a junkie. She's lying. Not now she isn't. Jennifer Taylor. She's the one that set me up. I figured you work for Johnny. Anything he wants. Anytime he wants it. You should have gone when you could, fellas. You can't let them go. Oh, heck, Miss Moore. Let's get out of here. I'm warning you. You got those photos of the crime scene? And the photos of the office from the governor's files. Well, I'll be doggone. Mackenzie? I'd like to recall Rosemary Sutter to the stand. Now, Miss Sutter, uh, I'm going to show you a list of documents which the police found in Governor Allison's office. I want you to examine this list carefully. Now, uh, to the best of your knowledge, is this list complete? No, sir, it's not. What's missing? A fax was sent to Governor Allison's office at 7.49, the night he was killed. Well, how can you be so sure of the date and the time? The governor asked me to check the ID number and to get a duplicate. What was so important about this particular fax? It was a document that he'd requested. An audit of the Pharmacol Corporation. And why was the Pharmacol Corporation so interesting? They were doing a lot of construction for the state. And uh, Governor Allison had heard rumors that it was really a front for organized crime. He was conducting a private investigation. And this fax that came in that night was part of the evidence? Yes. He asked me to obtain the duplicate as discreetly as possible. Thank you. Now, I'm going to show you Defense Exhibit G, Miss Sutter. This is a picture of the governor's desk as it was normally kept. Now, is this accurate? Is that the way it normally looked? Yes. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Miss Sutter. You've been very helpful. What is Johnny Steele to you, Miss Moore? We were lovers. Did you live with him for a period of time? For about two years. And when did you stop living with him? Uh, about six months ago. 
Is it true that Mr. Steele is currently under indictment by the federal government on racketeering charges? Objection. Relevancy. This is all going to tie together, Your Honor. Overruled. Yes. Do you know of any connection between Johnny Steele and the Pharmacol Corporation? Sure. He uh, practically owns it. Ah. And did he have a special interest in the last gubernatorial election? Yes. He said that if Allison had won, that he could keep all his dirty little deals a secret. He told you that? Yeah, he told me that. Now, for a while there, it looked like uh, Harlan Richards might win the election. What, if anything, did Johnny Steele do about that? He had me make sexual accusations against Harlan Richards. How did he get you to do that? When I lived with him, he started me on drugs. I got hooked. And then when he got sick of me, he kicked me out. Said I was a junkie. I'd never be anything else. So when he came around again and wanted me to lie for him, he knew I'd do it. I needed the money. I had to have the money. For drugs? Yes. Were these accusations true? Did you have an affair with Mr. Richards? No, I never did. Miss Moore, are you telling this court that Johnny Steele convinced you to tell a lie that was going to ruin a decent man's reputation? Yeah, but it wasn't Johnny's idea, see? He said he had no choice in the matter, that he had to do it for his partner. Who was his partner? Al Reinhardt, the attorney general. Thank you, Miss Moore. I appreciate what it took for you to come forward today. No more questions. No questions. Defense calls Al Reinhardt to the stand. Mr. Reinhardt, I'd like you to examine Defense Exhibit H, which I'm handing to you now. Mr. Reinhardt, uh, before you became Attorney General, were you and Governor Allison partner in a law firm? Yes, we were. Mr. Reinhardt, would you describe this uh, document to the court? It's a uh, standard contract for legal representation between my firm and the client. And according to this contract, who was Allison and Reinhardt representing? The Pharmacol Corporation. Were you aware that Johnny Steele controlled the Pharmacol Corporation when you agreed to represent it? No, I was not. No, I had no direct contact with Mr. Steele. We merely did some routine legal work for them, contract review, that sort of thing. So while your partner, Allison, was busy being governor, you involved the law firm with a known racketeer. I had no knowledge of that connection. Oh, we've heard testimony that Johnny Steele wanted Allison re-elected. Now we know why. It wasn't Governor Allison Johnny Steele wanted in the State House. It was you, his silent partner in crime, the Attorney General. That is a lie. I have no connection whatsoever to Johnny Steele. Isn't it true that you masterminded the sexual accusations against Harlan Richards so his death would look like a suicide? As far as I know, Harlan jumped out that window. Am I being accused of a crime you can't prove even happened? Oh, I don't have to do that, Mr. Reinhardt. I have evidence to prove that you killed Governor Allison. Objection. Relevancy. We're not here to try the Attorney General, Your Honor. Karen Richards is on trial for murder. Any evidence to the contrary should be admissible. You may proceed, Mr. McKenzie. Objection overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. You knew that Governor Allison was quietly investigating the Pharmacol Corporation, didn't you? And that worried you. I have no idea what you're talking about. When Allison got that fax and called you demanding that you come to his office, you knew the jig was up, didn't you? You knew you were going to jail. And you figured the only way to save your neck was to kill him. Now, that's how it went, wasn't it? No.
Mr. Reinhardt, would you identify this object, People's Exhibit 13, for the court? Um, it's a um, solid gold letter opener. There's an inscription there on the blade. Will you read it? The voting's done, we won, and the date, 11-5-93. Now, where did this letter opener come from, Mr. Reinhardt? Governor Allison's wife, Emily, had this made as a memento of his election victory. Oh, was this one of a kind, or were there others? Well, Mrs. Allison gave letter openers to the small group of people closest to Ryan. Oh. You still have your letter opener, Mr. Reinhardt? Of course. I'm going to show you Defense Exhibit J, a receipt from Tyler's Jewelers over on Alma Street. It's a bill for a letter opener they made for you with the inscription, the voting is done, we won, and the date, 11 5 -93. What do you know about this, Mr. Reinhardt? I lost the letter opener Mrs. Allison gave me when I moved into my new office in the State House, so I asked my assistant to order a copy. An identical copy? Of course. It's not what you got. It wasn't identical. My copy was identical in every respect. Except one. That always bothered me how someone having a heated argument with the governor could have taken the letter opener off his desk and then cross clear around and stab him with it without his trying to get up and defend himself. But just supposing. What if he wasn't stabbed with his own letter opener? What do you think of that, Mr. Reinhardt? I wouldn't know. Oh, but you would, Mr. Reinhardt. You took this letter opener, the one you had made from your office to use as a weapon when Allison called you in on the carpet. After you stabbed him with it, you took the one on the governor's desk with you when you left, thinking that nobody would ever notice the exchange. But fate was toiling against you, Mr. Reinhardt. The original letter openers were solid gold. Your copy was gold plate over lead. It says so right here on this receipt. With the district attorney's permission, we'll demonstrate. No objection. I reckon your assistant was trying to save you money, Mr. Reinhardt. The murder weapon was your letter opener, wasn't it? I'd better not say anything further. That's a good choice. Move for dismissal. People have no objection. Case dismissed. Court is adjourned. I'm so glad we got this sorted out. Congratulations, Bill. Ken, I never could have done it without you. <laughs> Come on, let's get back to the ranch and have some fun. Well, I wouldn't want to put you out. Oh, put me out. Listen, I can use your help. You know, I got the sweetest little vegetable garden that Della is just going to love. Della me. asked me to give you this. Uh... Wait a minute, doggone it. Seems like Della's best friend, Lila, has sprained her ankle and Della has gone to Hawaii to help her out. Hawaii? That's quite a trip. Well, Ken, it's just you and me. <laughs> Listen, we got fences to mend, stalls to clean up. Bill, out. thanks, but oh, you know... Oh, don't I... thank me. This is a treat. <laughs> Come on, if you're waiting for me, you're backing up. <laughs> 